Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Today is November 1st, 2023. We just finished our studies through the Corinthians, uh, both epistles. Uh, wrapped that up last Sunday. Uh, we're going to be beginning in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, next Sunday. So today I just want to cover a few things. Uh, I didn't really know how to fill this gap, what to do in between. Uh, I am not a, uh, uh, a, uh, a network uh, news journalist. I'm not a, uh, uh, I'm, there's a lot of news going around about what's going on. I've, I've been trying to put out some information on that. Uh, I have done a little bit of that, but we're going to uh, talk about something a little different uh, this Wednesday. Uh, I'm not sure how long this video will be. I want to cover a few things. I want to talk about a few things. In fact, uh, what I'd kind of like to do is just sort of sum up uh, what this ministry, Blessed Hope Forever, has uh, at least a few of the things that we've covered over the past six plus years. Uh, as you know, uh, many of you who follow this channel, you know this is a grace ministry. Uh, our emphasis has always been on the grace of God, the love of God, uh, the sovereignty of God, the will of God. Uh, we stand solid, rock solid, on these uh, principles that I'm getting ready to talk about here. I want to try to sum up everything I've talked about in the past six years in about 30 minutes. 30 to 40 minutes and so uh, I can't spend very long on each each uh, one of these uh, 20 things uh, probably just a couple of minutes on each one but I want to I want to just sort of review where we've come as far as uh, this grace ministry uh, in the past six years we've talked about new birth uh, the common uh, belief today is that, you know, if we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, if we do this, that, or the other thing, that uh, we will uh, become somehow miraculously, uh, at the time of our own choosing, will become born again by God from above, and which is probably the most foolish thing I've ever heard in all my 66 years. We were born again by a very special process that new birth originated from God. It did not originate from ourselves. Uh, we stand here at Blessed Hope Forever in opposition to that uh, deception, uh, which is basically permeates the entire institution of, of modern Christianity today. We were born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. Uh, that's uh, John clearly laid out for us in John 1.13 that it was according to His will, not ours, that we were born again. So I'm suggesting to you that if you accepted Christ as your Savior, if you repented of your sins, if you did anything in the sense that, that modern Christianity today uh, suggests we have to do in order to become born again, uh, I'm suggesting to you that the only way that you were able to do that is because you were born again. You did not believe in order to be born again. You believed because you were born again. I believe that is biblical. And it's, it's a principle that I've stood by for the past 36 years as far as the ministry is concerned. That brings me to the second point, and that is divine election. According to Ephesians 1.4, uh, we were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. Uh, he, he said to His, our Lord said to His disciples, you did not choose me, I chose you. And yet, despite that fact, much of modern Christianity today believes that, uh, well, just doesn't believe in election at all. You know, there's a sense of, uh, of unfairness about that. You know, that's just not fair. Everybody ought to have the ability, everybody ought to have the right to choose to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. His people will do that. His, his, those who are not 
will not, cannot, there's no possible way that they can accept him because they are totally depraved, they haven't been infused, they haven't been regenerated, they haven't been infused with life, quickened to life first. You've often heard me talk about putting the cart before the horse. This is what modern Christianity tends to do. They want to take what God did for us, which prompted some response from us, and they want to put our response first and then suggest that because of, of something that we did, then God, His hands were free to then do what He said that He did. And that is just not the case. So uh, when it comes to new birth, we are born again, uh, clearly born again by the will of God, not according to the flesh, not according to blood, uh, not according to any other thing except that Jesus Christ chose us in Him before the foundation of the, of, of the world, and that leads to the matter of justification. Justification in the Bible is a, is a clear statement that, that basically states that we were made righteous when Christ rose from the dead, that we were justified in Christ, made righteous, and when I'm, when I'm, what I'm suggesting to you is, is that the Word says that we are made the righteousness of God in Christ. How righteous is that? Well, that's, as I see it, it's, I have always seen that, that's pretty righteous. Uh, you can't become any more righteous by what you do, or you can't become unrighteous by something that you don't do or, or anything else. We've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. It's a truth that we stand upon as believers in Christ. It is an unchangeable reality. Once we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ, we can never become unrighteous. And of course, that leads us into the matter or the discussion of eternal security, which is probably not a very popular idea uh, today either. In 1 John 3, 9, we, we know that we have a sinless new man, that his seed abides in us. If we've been born of God, we have his seed who abides in us. And that righteous new man, us as a new creation, who have a, now have been made a new creation, we have a new man. That new man cannot sin just as the old man can do nothing but sin. So now we have a dilemma. We, we ha are faced with the, with the undeniable fact that we are a dual-natured creature, whereas be before we were born again, we only had one nature. Now we have two, which are in conflict with one another, just like we read in in, about in Romans chapter 7. And this sinless new man cannot be improved upon, nor can the old man be cleaned up and made righteous. It is a hard fact that we must stand solid upon if we are ever to expect uh, to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are positional truths things which God has done, and I want you to take note of the fact that as I go down this list, I'm not giving you, any, you folks anything to do. I'm telling you what God has done for you in Christ. He's made you a new creation. You have a new sinless nature that doesn't have the ability to sin because it's been born of God. God's children, He begat us, and God does not begat faulty children. God does not begat a, a, a new creation which in Christ which has the ability to sin. I'm not saying that we don't sin. I'm saying the new creation does not sin. Or, or the new man does not sin. We are a new creation in possession of an old man and a new man, but we're going to get to the, to the old man here in a minute and, and deal with that appropriately. We know that it is by grace that we're saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift from God. Uh, that's clearly spelled out for us in Ephesians 2.5. Uh, many Christians will quote that verse. Many, many Christians are, are, are quite comfortable with the fact of talking about how that we're saved by grace. 
But then it, we seem to slip away from that in our conversations uh, with others day, day after day, and, and more, even more so in our own personal walk, in our relationship, in our communion with God. We tend to shy away from that truth when we see sin in our life and we, become, we, we come to question the very reality of that grace that has saved us. We are saved by grace alone, not by works, lest any man should boast. We have been accepted in the Beloved. That is a very difficult concept for many Christians to grasp. Dearly Beloved, being accepted even on the human level you know, is, is something that, that many people just in general struggle with. You know, we just don't know if we're accepted by our parents or accepted by our spouse or, or accepted by our friends or, you know, and especially accepted by God because we do something, we stumble, we fall, we, 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 we look to God and, 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 uh, to uh, uh, forgive us uh, for what we've done uh, because we feel like that somehow we've slipped away, we've fallen away from that standing whereby He's accepted us in the Beloved. And I'm here to tell you that God is never displeased with us. He's accepted us in the, in the, in the Beloved. That's, that's our Lord Jesus Christ. That is where our standing is. He, he, doesn't, he didn't accept us on any other basis other than the fact that we were united with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection, which leads us to the matter of identification. Uh, it's a subject that's talked about very little in Christian circles today. We've been identified with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. When Christ died, folks, you died with Him. If you are a believer in Christ, you died when Christ died. When Christ died, you died with Him. Well, Steve, I don't have any remembrance of that. You weren't meant to have some memory of that. The, the, but the fact of the matter is, is that every single believer who would ever be in Christ died in Christ, died with Christ when Christ died. And for good reason. Because we have died to sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and death itself. Six things. I've talked about those six things before in previous videos. It is a phenomenal truth, folks, where that, where that God intends for us to understand that death, only death, only the ma a matter of death, will take and move us out of the way, out of, out of the picture altogether to where that our focus then is on Him, not ourselves, because uh, we were taken out of the way at Calvary. It is, uh, it is a wonderful truth that we can live by, walk by. Uh, our daily fellowship and communion with God is guided by that principle that we have died to sin. If we see sin in our life, we know we died to it. If others try to put us under the, back under the slavery, the bondage of law, we know that we've died to the law and so on and so forth. We died to sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and even death. One of the, the common misconceptions today is that our bodies are temples and we have to keep these temples uh, clean, consecrated uh, uh, before God. Uh, it's our, you know, we're just a bunch of little temples running around. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6.19, if you look at the verse closely, especially look at, looking at the grammar, what you will find out is, is what that is saying is that Paul is saying, do not all of you all know that all of y'all's bodies have become members of the one, he changes from plural to singular, one temple, which is Christ. We are all members of the one temple, and that temple is Christ. We are not, our physical bodies are not all temples of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, I prefer to use spirit because a ghost uh, implies a, a disembodied spirit. And so we are uh, identified with Him in His death, His burial, and His resurrection. So when Christ was raised from the dead, you were raised with Him 
and for a purpose, and that is to walk in newness of life, which is His life, not ours, because ours was left behind in the grave. Free will. Very touchy subject. Uh, I mean, it's, there's been many a fight, I'm sure, break out you know, between believers over the centuries concerning that, that one truth. Folks, I have the free will to do this. I had the free will, I think, in, in a sense. You could say I had, a, I had the free will to make this video today or I had the free will to not make this video today. Now, you can look at that that way. Of course, when, when, when you bring God's sovereign will into the matter and His direction in our lives and how he, God is working in our lives, I'm going to suggest that, that whether I make a video, whether I don't make a video, whether I make a sandwich for lunch today or if I don't make a sandwich for lunch today, whether I, whether I ate a hamburger or a hot dog, is, is you, you could call that some some measure of freedom, some measure of free will. But dearly beloved, there are so many verses on the fact of God's sovereign will being the directing the, the directing power uh, that governs our lives. Uh, Romans 7, chapter 7, verses 15 through 20 makes it clear that what I want to do, I don't do that. I do the very thing I don't want to do. And what I do want to do, that I don't do. I do the very thing I don't want to do. Uh, maybe I said that right. It's, it's sort of a sloppy paraphrase of, the, of the, those verses. But the passage is telling you and I that we have this old man that, and this new man that are in conflict with one another, which prevents us from doing what we want to do. And so... Uh, there's a the matter of free will. Now, as far as our new birth is concerned, the matter is crystal clear. Um, I re would refer you back to the very beginning, uh, new birth, divine election, uh, which factors into this equation. We were not born again by some decision that we made. Okay, if it was not for God's grace... you would not have had the ability to choose Christ. I don't know how many times through over the years as a Christian in, in meeting with other Christians, gathering together with them, holding Bible studies and speaking from the pulpit and speaking outside in the parking lot, I don't know how many times I've heard believers talk about being blessed from God. We, we as believers, typically it's sort of a habit. We go around saying, you know, God bless you. Uh, all the time with very little conversation about the fact that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. You know, the text says we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Of course, I haven't been blessed with a lot of the physical things that, that maybe I would the tip, typically that the flesh would like to, to have in life. You know what I mean? You know, I don't have, I don't, I'm not driving a, a brand new Ram pick, Dodge Ram pickup or, or I'd, I'd prefer to say Chevy. I don't, I don't own a big horse ranch. You know, uh, there's a lot of things that, that, that I could look to in my life and say, well, I haven't been blessed with uh, such great looks and, 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 and I certainly haven't been blessed with very eloquent speech, the ability to, uh, you know, I'm not some great orator. There's, there's many areas in which I haven't been blessed. But dearly beloved, the text is saying that you and I have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. You could not be blessed any more as a believer in Christ than what you already are. So if you're looking for God to bless you greater, in some greater way, spiritually, then you've moved out away from the reality of the text in, in Ephesians 1.3. 
folks, don't you believe that it would, can't you see how that it would make a tremendous difference in your life if you, if as you walked through this life, that it, it makes a diff difference whether you believe that or you don't. This brings me to Colossians 2.13 where I, I, I see that the sin issue has been forever settled. All our trespasses, all our transgressions, nailed to His cross. We know from other verses, you know, He's cast our sins as far as the east is from the west, buried Him in the depths of the sea to be remembered no more. And yet, without exception, the primary, it seems almost seems like the primary rule today among Christians is to focus on their sin. It's, it's almost as if we, if we don't focus on our sin, if we, don't, if we don't have some concern there about our sin, and we don't try to clean up that filthy old man, then we're not doing our job. I'm going to suggest to you that if we're focused on our sin and we're trying to clean up that old man, we're not doing our job. Our job is not to clean up the old man. Our job is not to conform our lives to the image of Christ. Our job is not to make our lives more righteous. We couldn't do that anyway than what they are already are in Christ. Isn't it amazing to you? It should be that God started you out Right from the very beginning, from day one, he set, he put you on in a place in which you couldn't become any more righteous by what you do or don't do. That has to have an effect in, in, in as far as your walk is concerned. The sin issue has been forever settled, and we are not part of this world religious system. I've talked a lot about the world and how that in the in the the New Testament, that word world is practically always found in the context of a world religious system that will hate you, that puts you to death, thinking it's doing God's service. World, in, in, in most of the thinking of Christians today, the, the idea, the concept of world, when they, when they look at the word world, is automatically their minds are, are drug off into the all the filth, okay? The world. I well, I know what the world is. The world is going to bars and, and you know, I mean, do, drinking, doing drugs, doing you know, the world, you know, uh, uh you know, uh, you know, fornication, uh, you know, adultery, you know, you can make your list, and that list is that list is it, it can become quite long. You know, you, you, need, you need more than one pen. You need to go get a, a package of big pens, like a dozen of them, and, and run all that ink out uh, to, and to finish that list. You, you, can, you can throw anything under the category of, of worldly, okay? Well, what, is, what does it mean to be worldly? I'm going to suggest to you that in the New Testament, as far as the new, the creation in Christ is concerned, the believer in Christ is concerned, world is a term that is used by God to define a religious system that is based on human merit, performance, production, human production, human performance, human merit. It is that that we are called to be come out and be separate from and this is what happens. This is what the Word does. We're, we are sanctified in truth. His Word is truth. Our lives are naturally... We don't conform our lives to the Word, dearly beloved. We don't do that. The Word conforms us to the life of Christ. And now we have uh, the subject of Satan. Well, you know the, the old phrase, devil, the devil made me do it. You know? Uh, I'm sure that in most Christian circles today, it's, it's quite a popular theme that, that Satan, you know, uh, he, he has this kind of way with us, you know, from time to time. 
Dearly beloved, 1 John 5.18 says that Satan cannot touch you. Now you can believe the verse, or you cannot. I'm telling you that Satan cannot touch you. Okay. I've done videos on on how that that uh, you know the common perception today uh, is that you know Satan can actually take and drag you down into hell. I mean, and you know if he if Satan worked hard enough and you were cooperated, if you cooperated with Satan enough. You know, you're going to lose your salvation. That's probably one of the most ridiculous things that I, I, I've ever heard. But the, the fact of the matter is that Satan has no hold on you. Satan cannot touch you. He can't do anything about any of these things that I'm talking about. He can't, he can't erase them. He can't move you out away from the area of, in which God has, has made these facts true in your life. Now he can cause you, without a doubt, he can cause you to doubt God. He, he can cause you to question the things that I'm talking about. But he can't change the reality. He can't change the fact that you've been born again by God, that he's chosen you in Christ, that you've been justified by faith, that you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ, that you're saved by grace, you've been accepted in the beloved, identified with Christ in in, in his death, burial, and resurrection, that you had no free will or any choice in the matter, that you were born again because you were God's child and he sowed you. Satan sowed his own tear. Tear doesn't become wheat, goats don't become sheep. And when Scripture talks about the lost, it's talking about His people. The lost, when we use that phrase, well, this guy's lost. Oh, this, this, this gal over here, she's lost. You know, she's, she's, going apart. she's gone apart from God, so she's lost. you got to be careful when you use that phrase because that, that phrase lost is not ever associated really with the non-believer. It is God's sheep that are lost. It's not some goat that's lost that... Christ goes and finds the goat, brings the goat back, and somehow that goat is miraculously transformed into a sheep. We are dead to the law. That's one that might get your face slapped if you go around talking about it too loudly within most Christian circles today. You're dead to the law. The whole idea behind most ministries today, most churches today, is that the very principle in which it operates is law. Never mind the fact that the entire epistle to the Galatians was written to address that very problem in the early first century church. Dearly beloved, you're not, you, you were never given the law to begin with. Not, not from the very beginning when you first became a Christian. It, it, the law was not something that was, that's done away with as you grow to some some level of spiritual maturity where that you no longer need the law. The law was never given to you at all. The church. I'm talking about the church. I'm not talking about Israel. I'm talking about the church. You were never under law as a rule of life, a principle of life. The law never made anybody righteous. It never will. We operate under the principle of grace, not law. We are dead to the law. That brings us back to our identification with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection, or that when He died, you died. Okay. Now, we know Christ was the fulfillment of the law. That's, but but you, you, when you died, you didn't fulfill the law. Or as you lived, you don't fulfill the law. Christ fulfilled the law. And now you have Christ, the fulfillment of the law, living in you, in which it is now Christ in us, the hope of glory. Uh, law is a major topic. It's it's probably it's it's almost very it's very difficult today for me to even preach a sermon without bringing law into it, because it is so per, it has so permeated the the institution of what is so called Christianity today that that's pretty much all believers think about when they think of Christianity. It's just well, it's just a, a long 
list of do's and don'ts and the books of the Bible's a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life and we do the best we try to do the best we can and God's pleased us with us uh, you know when we try uh, he's pleased even more with us when we succeed he's not very pleased with us at all when we fail you know our whole lives center around this this whole you know reality of law keeping as a rule of life it doesn't say we're dead to the law that's just well we're just dead to moses the law of moses and now there's somehow this somehow in the new testament now we're under this new 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 principle of law the law of christ it's the principle of christ all right but it is not law it has nothing to do with you trying to attain to or main, attaining or maintaining righteousness on a human level. Law will not do that. Uh, I, I thought really, really long and hard about going into the book of Galatians. After we finished Corinthians, I thought that that would be a good idea because uh, basically the entire epistle to the Galatians was, was written to address that Galatian error. Uh, and I thought we might could benefit from that. But I chose instead to go uh, into Acts, beginning with Acts chapter 1. And for as long as we're here, um, I'm, I'm actually hoping that we'll, we'll be raptured before I finish Acts. Uh, it, there's uh, over 20 chapters in Acts. It's quite a long uh, uh, book. But it's, it's something that I've always wanted to do. Uh, I've never taught verse by verse through Acts. I thought that it would be interesting, so... Uh, I do invite you to join us on that on Sundays. This brings us to, to the daily reality of reckoning, Romans 6.11, reckon ourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Reckoning, dear folks, is the first command given us in the New Testament. That, that alone right there should get everyone, every Christian's attention. It's, it's, uh, it's in the... It's a commandment. It's a command. It's in the imperative mood. Uh, it, it deals with the, the whole matter of sin in the believer's life. It's accounting it tr to be true. Reckoning is a bookkeeping term. Uh, we reckon it true that we've not only died to a law, but uh, we've uh, uh, been made alive in Christ. We, we reckon ourselves to be dead indeed un unto sin, but alive unto, unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is a, a daily ongoing activity. It is crucial. It is vital. If we are, it, folks, if you're not reckoning daily yourself dead to sin, then you're dragging that sin problem along, along, along with you as you go through life. And then we come to the matter of true confession. Uh, 1 John 1, 9, it's a passage most Christians are familiar with. Uh, we can, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. See, Steve, you know, we need to be focused on our sin because how, if, how, how is it that we're told to confess sin if we're not to be focused on our sin? I have suggested in past videos, and I'll suggest again now, that that passage in 1 John 1, 9 that speaks of true confession is not speaking of what you think it's speaking about. It's not about naming our sins. Well, Lord, I'm sorry, today I did, or this past week I did this and that and that and that, and we've, we've made us a list, and I've, I've actually known Christians who would write that stuff down and, and keep it in their pocket, you know, and of course, at the, end, at the end of that list, if there's anything we forgot, we always have to make sure that we include in that statement, uh, please forgive me for all those that I forgot to name. Folks, all that does is cause you to focus on your sin. All that does is prove that you've ignored the reality of, of true reckoning, that you've ignored the reality of the sinless new man, the new man who cannot sin, The word confess, dearly beloved, means to speak the same thing. It's 
The word is homilageo. It means to speak the same thing that God says about our sin. Well, what has God said about our sin? I, I think if, if you've paid attention to this uh, since the start of this video, I think you know. We're not to be... We need, we need to say the same thing about our sin that God does. And what does He say about it? Well, He says, he says, says several things. Uh, first and foremost, He says that we died to it. It's not I who sins, but sin which dwells in me, says Paul in Romans chapter 7. Now we're getting into the area of, 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 of actually being involved in uh, true confession in the way that we're supposed to. And then there's, well, Steve, we've got to keep His commandments. The word keep there is, is tereo in the Greek. It means to guard. The word is used often used as a prison guard one who guards a prison, prisoner. We keep His, his commandments. And why does the text in John 14, 15 say that we keep His commandments? We keep His commandments because we love Him. Now, we know that He loves us. We, we know that we love Him because He first loved us. If you're a believer in Christ, you love Him. You love Him. Now, if you're walking by sight, you're probably not going to feel like you love Him. But you, you love Him because He first loved you. If ye love Me, He said, which you do, guard My commandments. Every single born-again believer in Christ guards His commandments because they love Him. And why do they love Him? Because He first loved us. Now, if you want to talk about the matter of works. I'm, I'm happy to do that all day long. We walk in, in His works. The works that, that uh, it is... Uh, if we go to uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are actually walking... Those are the works that we walk in. And that is the finished work of Jesus Christ. His work. We walk by faith, 2 Corinthians 5.7. We saw that in the 5th chapter of 2 Corinthians. It is, it is a faith walk. The Paul in Romans uh, chapter, I believe, 3 or 4 talks about, in 5, talks about the, ju the, the righteousness that is based on faith. It's faith's righteousness. It's a righteousness that belongs to faith. I've always believed that, that uh, faith exercised equals the righteousness of God. I'm talking about on a practical, experiential level. Now, it is true. We've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. We can't become any more righteous by what we do or don't do. But, uh, but that's, that's our position in Christ. That's the new man that cannot sin. He, he, fully righteous. Couldn't become any more righteous if he tried to become righteous. But we walk by faith. We don't walk by sight. That's a fleshly walk. That's a law walk. And that leads us to resting in Him. Hebrews 4.11 We rest in Him. Just as God rested from His work, six days of creation, and He rested that Sabbath, just, just as that's true, Concerning God, there's the matter uh, concerning us that's true that we rest from ours, just as He did from His. We rest in Him. It's one of my favorite phrases. I use it a, 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 an awful lot when it comes to correspondence. Uh, I'm often encouraging believers to rest in Him. There's nothing greater. Resting in His goodness. Resting in His love. Resting in His forgiveness. Resting in the fact that you have been made a new creation in Christ. That you, your new man cannot sin. Resting in the fact that, that it, was, it, was, it was God the Father who chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. Can you somehow see that our Heavenly Father works in the lives of His children through positive 
reinforcement. If the Word of God, I've, I've said this and I, many times and I'll keep on saying it, if you don't find comfort in that book, in the Word of God, if that, if that book does not comfort and encourage you, it's not the Word of God. Because that's what the Word of God does. I love you all. I truly do. Hang tough. We're going home soon. Until then, rest in Him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.